All right. Well, it's 10.05, so I will go ahead and get started. I don't think we've had anyone new join, so I won't repeat. Uh, what I'm going to do is go through a presentation, uh, talk to you about uh, the elements of the application, uh, give you some comments about things that have been problematic in previous applications to kind of give you a heads up. Uh, and then I'm going to show you the website and demo the login for the grant application and the grant account. So I'm going to start screen sharing. So uh, can everybody see that all right? Yes. Either unmute yourself. Okay, gotcha. So uh, the program is first, first and foremost, it's competitive. Um, we have a limited number of proposals. Whoops, and I du duplicated proposals in that. Uh, will be improved. What we have uh, done in previous years is that we've approved somewhere between 30 and 50 percent, depending on our budget and the number of applications. So your chances aren't bad, um, but it is competitive. So keep that in mind when you're doing it. And grant funds will be available only if the Institute of Museum and Library Services receives a federal appropriation. Uh, part of that reason is, unlike many other funds that we're used to, federal funds don't encumber. So we can't say, well, we'll use this year's funds for you next year that we already have. Uh, we can only use next year's funds. And as an FYI, Congress hasn't actually passed a budget for next year yet. So I don't actually have an allotment for next year. We, of course, expect Congress to pass a budget uh, relatively soon. Um, but at this point in time, I'm not 100% sure what our allotment will be. I'm anticipating at least a quarter of a million dollars for this program. Um, if there's significant changes, we will, of course, notify everybody. Uh, but that gives us the option of mm, somewhere between 10 and 15 approved proposals. So first recommendation I'm going to say is read the grant documentation thoroughly. Uh, there's a lot of information in the grant documentation. Uh, some of it seems a little on the grant verbiage side. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with that type of language, if you're unfamiliar with the concepts in the grant documentation, you're welcome to call me and we can walk through it. All of the documentation, both to apply for a grant and to manage a grant once you get it, is at the Improving Access Grant uh, section of our uh, website. We just changed over to a new website uh, content management system on the 18th. Uh, and I will tell you, uh, there are some errors <laughs> on my pages. Uh, in fact, uh, some of my um, documentation did not come through correctly. So you can find the application information packet, both the literacy and the digital inclusion and focus, as well as um, the local history focus. There's a grant administration manual if you want to look through that and see what your requirements are before you get into writing an application in case this is something that you feel you might not be able to handle as a grantee. There is the program timeline. And at the bottom of each grant page, there are some additional documents that apply across all of our grants. These are things that are good to look at because they are going to apply to your grant when you start um, actually doing your activities. Uh, you will be required to credit IMLS and LM. So there's information on how to do that. You will be required to do some form of evaluation and outcome based is almost required from IMLS. If you're doing something that it really doesn't fit, uh, you can make a case that you can do something different. Um, what you're not allowed to say is an evaluation doesn't apply to my project. IMLS won't accept that. And I report these level of grants to IMLS one on one. So I will submit a single report for each improving access grant to IMLS. Um, they're a very collegial group to work with, but we do like to give them what they need uh, because they do take that information and turn around and use it to explain to Congress why libraries need funding. Uh, there is some information on indirect costs. If you are going to ask for indirect costs, please read that. If it uh, is confusing and federal indirect cost rates can be confusing, give me a call. Uh, we can talk through what, uh, how's your, how yours works. 
There's also an LSTA grant activity statistics guide. Please look at that because I will need those statistics when you turn in your final report. So those are things that you're going to need to be collecting throughout your grant program. There is a reimbursement request checklist. Uh, that's just kind of a, a how-to helper um, when you ask for reimbursement for your expenses. Uh, and there is some information on required evaluation questions to go with that uh, outcome-based evaluation. So this particular grant program, uh, the library service, excuse me, uh, the improving access to information, uh, the grant program eligibility is public and academic libraries. So if you are a different library type um, and uh, you're looking at this grant program, you could work with a public or academic library, but only public and academic libraries may apply. And all applicants must be eligible at the time of application. So keep that in mind. There are a couple caveats to that um, in, in terms of time of application. You must meet all these criteria. You must have paid library staff. You must have a regular schedule of library services. You must have a dedicated facility, an annual budget, multi-type library cooperation. We tend to think of this as like interlibrary loan. If you're a public library, this is where the at time of application comes in. You must be lawfully established and currently eligible for state aid. Um, if you're getting funding from LM for state aid, you're eligible for state aid. If you're an academic library, you must be currently accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. So uh, any comments? Oh, I'm gonna pull off the chat so I can see that. Any comments at this point? Any questions about eligibility? Nobody. Alrighty. And a note on lead organizations. This particular grant doesn't require partners. However, if there are multiple organizations that are working together in the proposal you're thinking of, uh, the lead organization would be the applicant and again would have to be eligible. Um, a library system can apply on behalf of an individual branch, selected branches, or the entire institution if the individual libraries meet the standard for operations. Uh, the way this would work in an academic library is um, if you are working with another department within the university, the academic library would be the lead applicant. Uh, we have had some uh, suggested proposals where the library was assisting a department to do something that would then stay in that department. And we said that was not allowable uh, this relates to library collections. However, if the library is going to work with the department to have something that would then be held and be part of the academic library collection, that would be allowable. And fiscal agents. The fiscal agent is has to be part of the lead organization. You cannot uh, nominate someone outside of your organization to manage the finances. Uh, however, if you are underneath a larger organization such as a municipality or a university the likelihood is your fiscal staff will not be your library staff so keep that in mind so any questions on fiscal agents no so overall for the grant as a whole we do have three priority areas we have literacy we have local history and special collections and we have digital inclusion uh, this particular one, the focus is digital inclusion. Uh, you can suggest a proposal in any of these three areas. Um, you can discuss in your proposal ongoing capacity, i.e. increasing capacity that you have for something you're already doing, or to start something new. Uh, and I'm going to skip past, I'm using the same presentation for the other focuses, I'm going to skip past the literacy and the digital inclusion. For special collections, this is the language directly out of the application packet. We're interested in projects that engage local communities in the collection, documentation, or preservation of their local histories, experiences, and identities. Uh, so we do uh, like proposals that have a focus versus we want to scan and digitize everything in this room. Uh, some examples are preservation and promotion of an existing collection. I'm thinking some things that have been done in the past. Uh, Wayne State University uh, did 
worked with the Arab American Museum uh, to uh, preserve a collection of oral histories of Arab American auto workers. Uh, you can collaborate with a local museum to bring together a themed collection. That example also works for that. You can remediate metadata for an existing digital collection so that it can be included in the Digital Public Library of America. So there's some possible options there. Um, but we do like there to be uh, a community focus um, versus just straightforward digitization. Um, also for if your focus is digitization specifically versus other options dealing with a special collection or local history, uh, there are a lot of expectations for digitization proposals in the application packet. We, you must address all of those expectations in your proposal. They're pretty stern expectations. So this year we do have a follow-up application webinar. Um, Biz Gallo, our digitization consultant, is going to be doing a planning for a digitization or preservation project webinar on April 7th at 2 p.m. You can register for that uh, on the application page. And if you look through the uh, application packet, you listen to Biz's um, presentation and you go, I don't see how our staff can handle this. Uh, so does that mean you can't apply for a project like this? It doesn't. You can hire a company or an individual with that expertise as a service in your project proposal. If your staff has that expertise, you can include staff salaries in your proposal. Uh, but what you can't do is say, this isn't something that uh, this isn't something that we have expertise in, so we're not going to do that. So if that makes sense. You guys are being awfully quiet in chat, so um, any questions? Nobody? All righty. So there are two other specific things to think of with digitization uh, as a focus for local history and special collections. If you're going to digitize materials, you do have to have a detailed plan to provide the project content to the Michigan Hub for the Digital Public Library of America. This is something you can discuss in detail with Biz uh, and with um, the Michigan uh, Hub staff. I'm blanking on the name of the Michigan Hub. Biz Mike could Rick Adler at the yeah. Michigan Service Hub. The Michigan Service Hub. I knew there was another word in the name of, of it. Now it's like blank. <laughs> Not enough coffee. Um, this is something we expect you to address in your proposal uh, and manage within your grant activities. Um, we're less likely to be happy with, and we'll figure this out after the grant is open as part of your proposal. Um, and give me just a second here. So the proposal also needs to include documentation of copyright permission or that materials are outside of copyright. So other things to think of with your focus. We've told you our three priorities uh, and our, um, we're discussing the priority for digital, um, excuse me, uh, special collections and local history. There's also the focuses that fall under the IMLS authorizing legislation. Um, all of our grants do um, come through uh, federal funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And IMLS has a specific focus to improve or develop new services that target populations from diverse geographic, cultural, socioeconomic backgrounds, individuals with disabilities, uh, functional literacy, limited English proficiency, or limited information literacy skills. So if there is an aspect of that to your proposal, do bring that out. If your proposal doesn't have an aspect like, um, like that, it doesn't mean you can't uh, apply for the grant, uh, but it does mean that uh, someone who can make a clear case to fit these focuses may score better in a proposal. Um, if this is an earlier version of some of the issues we discuss now under digital, excuse me, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, this has been a focus of IMLS for some period of time. And if the improving access part of this particular grant program, we are looking for you to demonstrate how you are improving this access to the community 
and how it can increase the reach of the library to new users. That is the title of the grant program, that it is improving access. A lot of this may deal with a collection, but the focus of your proposal uh, overall should not be, we need this collection. It should be how you're going to bring that collection to these users. So make sure you address that well in the, in the proposal. Did I make sense on that? Everybody's been quiet. So that's my, my final comment on those focuses and priorities. If you don't see uh, the text of your proposal clearly in those, uh, read through it and revise it to make that more explicit. So a note on collaboration. Collaboration uh, is when you're working with a partner. Partners are not required. However, if you have one and are going to include uh, partner agreements in your proposal um, and in the, the text of how you're going to manage your activities, a partner is going to be an organization that brings resources to the project. They're going to do staff time. They're going to provide you with some local funding, equipment, training. They are not someone who writes you a letter of support. Um, they're not someone who will use the end product and says they're happy the library can provide the end product. They're going to actively work with you through that grant period. Um, your partners should be part of your community. Occasionally we get a vendor listed as a partner. Vendors are not partners. Uh, vendors are people, if, if you're paying them to do the service, they're not a partner. Um, our view on partners is it should be um, an active enough relationship that a memorandum of understanding between you as the lead organization and your partner is recommended just so that it's very clear at the start of the project who's doing what. Uh, it can become difficult halfway through if one of you thought the other one was doing something and then you have uh, issues with getting your grant activities done on time. I do have a question about that. Can uh -huh. you partner with a lot, another library that may be already getting funding from you, the, the same you, grant? No. Okay. Um, you cannot have two applications for the same proposal, but you if, can partner with another library. So if they're working on a different project and they got funding for that project and we are working on a project and we just need to borrow equipment or something like oh, that. Oh, back and forth like that. Yes, that would be fine. Okay. You just can't, you can't double dip on a single project. Right. No, that's not what I meant. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Gotcha. No, that would be absolutely fine. Okay. Karen, it's Hope. I got a yes. question. Go ahead, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were going to say something. Um, okay. So with regards to partners, so say, for example, we partnered with our municipality to add to a digit to a digitized, you know, like a uh, collection that we're trying to do. Right. Uh -huh. um, and th that municipality is supposed to like help add some of their stuff, right? What would make them a partner and not just a supporter? Does that make sense? Um, so I can give you an example. Go ahead, so, please. Uh, our, our village right now uh, manages a cemetery database uh -huh. and we would like to partner with them. If they're just hand, if they're just handing over the data to you and you're the one doing the work, I would have no, no, a hard time no, seeing I mean, that as a partner. Right now, but if, if they're helping create content okay. uh, for the grant, then absolutely they would be a partner. Like if they're already doing that, like they're the ones physically maintaining a, a database. We just want to include the, what they're doing to our project. Is that a partner? Yeah, I, I think that can still be a partner because they're going to have to work with you in terms of how you include that material. Um, you know, it would kind of depend on on how it falls out. You're welcome to talk to me, you know, at the point you are ready to start writing the proposal and go, do you want me to include them as a partner? Um, 
if if you are expecting them to provide you with data or work though even if you don't include them as a partner on the grant i do recommend an mou it helps um that way so, no one is surprised <laughs> okay but with regards to the money right is that as a partner would they be allowed to tap into whatever grant we would receive if we were approved Mm, I'm going to, to give you, I'm going to give you a lawyerly answer. It <laughs> depends. Okay. Um, if you were going to purchase equipment and the township wanted to retain ownership of that equipment after the grant, no, that would not be acceptable. It's a, it's a library grant. Um, however, if they're working side by side with you and you know, they're going to dedicate, you know, five hours a week of staff time to the funded grant activities. Okay. They could be included in the staff salaries. Ah, okay. Um, but okay. you are, you're a township library, correct, Hope? No, 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 we're district. Oh, you're a district. You would be the fiscal agent. So right. in actuality, um, they would not be salaries since they are not your fiscal agent. They would, they, they would invoice you as a service and you would pay them as a service. Okay. But they could still be qualified as a partner? Yes. Okay. They're it's just, they're just essentially invoicing you for their time if they have paid time. The only, what, okay. I'll get into it in the budget section, but. Okay. So what about if, say, for example, they wanted to digitize this right now, like I said, it's a database, right? Mm -hmm. But if, you know, like, would they still be a partner or would we be allowed to if, say, for example, they needed to digitize like cemetery maps? You could, inc you could include that. Okay. So if they do digitization on their own, would they be allowed to be included in the money on that? Only one? if it is part of the grant project. I'm not quite sure I'm clear on that one. It would have to be activities you described in the grant proposal okay. uh, and funding you listed in the budget. Ah, uh, I see what you mean now. Okay. If All it's, right. if it's because essentially your grant proposal right. is your side of the grant contract if you're accepted and okay. you're agreeing that with that money, you will do those activities and those expenditures. And would that be laid out on a memorandum of understanding? I think you should. Okay. Uh, if you opt not to, that's up to you. But I think you should. Um, it prevents distress later sometimes. Oh, sure. No, I mean, they might have a different clerk who may not want to do it. Yeah. Okay. okay. I see. Now, is there supposed to be a time, a time frame or something like that that we would say if we did this memorandum of understanding to say, you know, like, um, the deadline, you know, like the, not deadline, but this is only up until like five years from now or something like that. If we, we could talk about this in more detail after okay. Sorry. The, the presentation, yeah. but yeah. I would think your MOU would definitely include timeframes. Definitely. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, so I'm like, well, um, I've got a little bit more information here about partners, uh, and I kind of have a broader definition here. Uh, some of our grants, um, uh, library cooperatives or ISDs can partner, so you can kind of ignore that bullet point. Uh, for those of you that are academic libraries that are on, is the explanation of uh, departments within the same college, uh, does that make sense to you? Nobody's going to jump in. Okay. So some things that you can't ask for in the proposal. Standard library operations. Uh, the pro grant will not fund standard library operations. So if you're doing basic collection development, uh, if you're doing automation, uh, just general staffing not related to a particular grant program activities, uh, equipment replacement, those will not be granted. So keep that in mind. Requests for upgrades, collections, or equipment that are new to your organization but aren't integral to the grant proposal will also be considered standard library operations and will not be granted. So essentially what this says is um, if you need something for your collection, if you need uh, equipment, you need computers, you need staff time, it has to be for the activities of the grant proposal and it has to be needed for those activities. 
Um, otherwise, it will be considered uh, something not related to your grant activities. And this relates to the idea, um, this is a federal idea of supplanting versus supplementing. Uh, federal grants typically are intended to supplement local uh, activities, not supplant. So a way to understand this is if these are activities or materials that you typically would already have in your budget, then it's supplanting local funds and would be considered unallowable. If it's something new in your budget, uh, then it would be considered supplementing local funds uh, and it would be allowable. Capital expenditures, requests that include construction or renovation uh, will not be granted. Uh, this is not particularly a federal issue. It is an Institute of Museum and Library Services issue. The authorizing legislation for the agency precludes any expenditures uh, relating to capital costs. Even if you need it for your grant activities, it is unallowable. So an example would be um, when we did our, our ARPA grants uh, this last summer, some folks requested uh, remote lockers. They're going to need cement pads and electrical wiring that could not be paid with a grant that had to be paid locally, even though they were purchasing the locker itself through the grant. So just a quick recap, if it's standard library operations, if it's supplanting local funds or staff or capital expenditures, uh, we cannot support it with a grant program. So the basics and the timeline. The grant time frame is one year. It's October 1st to September 30th. Um, right now, that may sound like a long time to you. Um, it tends to end up being quite short. So um, think very carefully about uh, your planning of your timeline. The minimum award is $5,000. The maximum award is 25. The funds are dispersed on a reimbursement basis only. So that's also something to consider with your uh, financial standing is you have to spend the money and document how you spent the money before I can reimburse you. I do request that reimbursements are at least quarterly. Sometimes a library will wait until the end of the grant. Uh, and when we've had that happen in the past, it tends to make things a little disorganized and hard to uh, recap. So at least quarterly, we want you to either say, I have no reimbursement or submit your documentation. You can submit more often uh, if you have cash flow issues. That's something you can talk to me one-on-one -on -one if you're approved. Other things for you to consider uh, with LSTA funds, you can't lobby. You can't do general advertising for your library. You can advertise the specific activities of the grant program though. You can't buy things that do not directly relate to the grant activities, meaning you cannot do the grant project if you don't have those. Um, and then there is a tech company ban. This is referenced in 2 CFR, um, that's Code of Federal Regulations 200-216. Um, what that means is if you were purchasing any technology, um, video surveillance, computers, et cetera, you cannot purchase them from companies that have been banned by the federal government. Uh, and this is something you would check in SAM.gov. Um, just as an FYI, that if you want to purchase those things, they are allowable. You just have to be careful who you purchase from. And they're not referencing um, necessarily who you make the purchase from. This isn't an issue of buying it at Best Buy or Amazon. It's who the manufacturer is. So, and food and furnishings are problematic at the best of times. Uh, and frankly, we recommend that you don't plan on providing food or furnishings uh, through LSTA funds. Um, it can be really difficult to craft the proposal such that you can use those. So our timeline, the application was available. Um, I'm sorry, Karen. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> One other, uh, you know, like with the, the other, um, the previous slide that you had, uh, mm -hmm. what, of what's not allowable. Thank you. Uh, the general advertising, I understand, cannot be included, but can we include in our budget proposal for the project uh, promotion for the particular project? That we're doing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. 
that's completely allowable. Um, you can say, you know, come, come learn about this great new um, resource that we've done in our local history collection. Absolutely allowable as a cost. Handouts. Uh, other, like, okay. Um, what you can't say is, is come to the library. We have a great local history room. Oh, okay. I see. But if, say, for example, there's like... Um, uh, so here's a here's a, here's an example. We had uh, been part of a community foundation, you know, for Southeast Michigan mm -hmm. uh, uh, pilot project grant for a sport port, which is to loan out sports equipment. Right. Mm -hmm. Part of the budget that I submitted to them was for promotion and advertising, which included like being able to purchase ads in our community ed. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. That's fine. The program. So something very similar to that will be yep. okay. That All would right. be fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We just, we get a lot of questions from the library community at large going, why don't you promote our libraries? And it's like, well, because federal funds don't allow us to do that. Um, so our timeline is we're doing the, the grant writing webinars now. The application due date is, and I put down Monday, and I'm going to lean over and look. Is it really Monday? It is actually Tuesday. I mistyped. I thought I made a mistake there. Uh, it is Tuesday, May 31st by 5 p.m. That is a rigid deadline. Um, if you do not submit by 5 p.m., and I admit I let it drift for, you know, 20 minutes to a half an hour. After that, you're out. If you contact me the next day, you will not be allowed to apply. Um, we do proposal review in June and July. Uh, and then we do award announcement letters and grant award notices. This is Department of Education lingo for grant contract. Uh, they will be done in August. I should be mailing them to you in August if your proposal is accepted. Um, we will do grant administration training in September. That is required. Uh, and then your start date will be October 1st. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with doing grants uh, with federal funding, what that means is do not do anything that you want to be covered by uh, grant funds before October 1st. Um, if you purchase something, you have staff time on planning that happens before October 1st, that's local funds. And I assume you're going to be need to be doing at least some basic get ready planning. You can't include that in the grant reimbursements. And if you have things you need to purchase, if you're concerned about getting them in a timely manner, you can have the purchase ready to go. Um, excuse me, the order ready to go, but you cannot place it until October 1st. So just keep that in mind. You do have quarterly reports and reimbursement requests if your proposal is approved. They are the end of December, March, June, and September. The quarterly report is brief, half a page to a page. It's just giving me an update. So um, we make sure that we're both on the same page about what's going on with your project. If you need to revise your budget, or excuse your budget, your project uh, in a significant fashion, you have a deadline of the last business day of April. Um, the thought being there that if you revise it later uh, than that, you're not going to have time to complete the changes. If you have small revisions, can I buy this instead of that? Uh, can I reassign staff? Those are things that you can contact me by email and they're fine up to the last month or two. Your grant expenditures need to be complete by the last business day of August so that you can complete your reimbursement request by the last business day of September. This is not a federal issue. This is an issue for us as uh, a state department. Uh, when the state closes its books, uh, in the fall for the previous fiscal year, it is closing the books on the federal funds as well. So I have to have all of your reimbursements in order before the state tells me I can no longer make payments from that fiscal year. And then your final report is due the last business day of October. So the application is online. It is open now. Um, the link is uh, at michigan.gov slash LSTA and I'll demo that in a few minutes. Double check my time here. I need to go a little faster. So the required elements of the application. Uh, first, that it's due May 31st. Um, you have to submit the online application. That's number one. 
If you're going to discuss partner activities in the proposal, you must include partner, whoops, partner statements. If you don't have a partner, you don't have to submit those statements. You do need to submit both a SIPA and a board assurances uh, document that is on the website. Um, that is one of the biggest technical kickouts for our grants. People will think that I'm not purchasing uh, technology equipment, so I don't have to sign the SIPA statement. You do. Uh, what you do is sign it and say, I'm not purchasing anything that applies. If you are purchasing technical equipment, then you sign it and say, I'm going to, to, to comply. Uh, academic libraries are not required to comply, so you would say it doesn't apply. Uh, and then the board assurances, they are essentially your signatures for the contract. People accidentally upload versions that are not completely signed. Your grant will not be accepted without completely signed board assurances. So please double check that. Uh, if you are concerned at all, if you submit um, by the Friday before, I will double check all of your documentation and make sure that your signatures are correct. So keep that in mind. You do have to include a budget spreadsheet separate from the proposal. And if you're doing digitization, you're going to need to do a copyright assessment. And there is a sample form for you to use on the website. The extra documents, two through five, you upload within the application. Do not email them to me. Um, our fire, state firewall is extremely tight. And we have no guarantee we will actually get documents you email to us. Most of the time we do. Sometimes we don't. And it will not go into a junk file. It will just never come to me. So if you're having trouble attaching documents to the application, contact me immediately. Uh, but they must be included with the online application. Within that uh, application, there are project information inf uh, elements. There's applicant information. There's the project administration, project partners, and then the project proposal. Those first four bullet points are pretty quick. They're, this is who I am. This is my library's address. These are the people who will work on it. The proposal is 10 questions and should be about 10 pages. Uh, that's where you're going to spend a significant amount of time. Uh, and then there are some checklist things. These primarily relate to things I need to turn around and tell IMLS. So what state goal, uh, and this relates to our five-year plan for uh, LSTA funding, what federal LSTA intent, federal LSTA subjects, these are just check boxes. Our, there isn't a wrong answer. Uh, we want you to pick the one that most closely matches your proposal. A target population, if you have one. Uh, and then finally, your budget. That is also a fairly significant amount. Um, so you will probably spend a good deal of time on your budget as well. So the additional documents that you upload, just a recap here, are your SIPA compliance statement, your board resolutions, your partner statements if you have them, and your budget. So in the applicant information, you see you're going to tell applicant library name, your type of library, confirm the eligibility checklist. The thing to keep in mind here is your UEI number. If you, this is the unique entity identification number. Um, the federal government is shifting away from using DUNS numbers uh, as an identifier number for vendors and grantees. Uh, they are now going to a number that they manage. Uh, if you do not have one of these, you will do it through sam.gov. Uh, it is a 12-digit number that is both letters and numbers. If you are part of a larger organization, your organization should get the number. This is not intended for a department uh, to get on their own. It's intended to be an identification number for your overall institution. So if you're part of a university, um, the university should have one. Uh, if you're part of a municipality or township, they should have one. If you are a district, you need to get it on your own. Um, and I cannot, this is one of the other things, I cannot accept an application without a UEI number um, as of April 1st, so within the next week or so. And I see Kimberly uh, says, 
uh, has a question about the copyright assessment. I'll show you where the document is, and Biz will talk about that in more detail on that April 7th um, webinar. And you can also contact us uh, prior to that webinar with any specific questions you have. Um, the project administration, we want to know who your director is. We want to know who your grant administrator is. This is the person who will do the day-to-day -day activities of the grant. If they are the same person, still let me know that. Your fiscal agent, again, must be part of the applicant organization. It might be somebody in your city or your university. This is the person who is going to be responsible for making your reimbursement requests and will need to know that funds will be coming. And your authorized official. This is one where I'm going to take you at your word, but an authorized official is a very specific legal definition here. It is the person who can legally sign contracts for your organization. It is frequently not the director of an academic or public library. It is frequently somebody in the municipality or somebody in the university uh, administration. Sometimes with some libraries, it is your board chair. Um, but essentially, by authorized official, we mean someone who can legally sign a contract and hold your library to uh, a legal contract. If somebody is the same, you know, in a small district library, the same person may be all four, sign all four lines. Don't leave anything blank because that's confirming to us who they are. Uh, project information is pretty basic. Project title, how much funds you're requesting, start and end dates if you're not going to do something different than October 1st and September 30th. Um, do note you can't start before or end after. But if you're going to do something that's a little more compact, that lets me know that. Um, for the proposal, it's about 10 pages. Um, it is not an essay, it's a project plan. I do tend to get answers to questions that are essays about the library as a public good. Um, I'm more concerned with your detailed activities of how you're going to accomplish the grant um, activities. Each question is different. If you find yourself repeating content between questions, step back and take a look at the questions. If you can't see how to make your answer different, give me a call. We'll chat about it. Um, but it's not very long at 10 pages. So I'm going to say, be concise and be specific. Uh, don't leave questions in your reviewers' minds about how you're going to accomplish something. If someone else was more specific than you and looks like they have a better plan, their proposal may be selected over yours. Um, I do have an acronym that I picked up from a grants conference that I thought was good. Doing research, engaging your partners, apply what you've learned, from your partners in your research and then tell us how you're going to deliver it. So the project abstract is the first one. It's 160 words. It is something that IMLS will publish publicly after we report on your grant. No jargon and you should be able to understand what your project is from that. Um, you know, it's your elevator speech, 160 words. Then you have a one page project purpose. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? You have a target population need. Explain why you think your community needs this. How did you figure that out? Um, if you're targeting specific groups within your community, who they are. A one-page impact. How is what you're going to do impact that population or that community need? You have a project design of three pages. Um, I recently increased this for the digitization to five since there are so many um, things to deal with if it's digitization. So if you have the subset of digitization, you'll have more space. And I, it's really hard to section this off uh, from one type of proposal to another without having multiple applications. So in general, if you're not digitizing, you, have, you can stop at three pages. If you are digitizing and you need more space, you have that option. There's an evaluation plan question that's one page. Sustainability, how you're going to maintain uh, this content, this collection, this program after the grant funds end. Uh, frequently, a lot of proposals are weak on this. Keep that in mind. A project timeline that's one page. 
uh, this I, I want very detailed. In October, we're going to do A, B, C, and D. And so November, we're going to do E, F, and G. And I want you to lay out uh, all of your activities. You don't need to explain them further. You have already done that in this project design section. But the project timeline is when you're going to say, and this is when we're going to start this part, and this is when we're going to start this part. And then a one page personnel. You can, as an option, include resumes uh, in an appendix. Um, I'm going to say you don't have to include resumes unless you think they're going to give us significantly more information about the qualification of your personnel. So general notes on this. It's going to be reviewed by the Advisory Council. The uh, Library of Michigan has an LSTA Advisory Council that is drawn from libraries of all types and from around the state. Uh, we do solicit volunteer peer reviewers. They tend to be mostly public and academic librarians and also Library of Michigan staff. Um, those reviews are very important for this program. So keep that in mind. Um, Library of Michigan staff rarely gainsays the peer reviewers. If the peer reviewers have misunderstood uh, a criteria or a grant requirement, we may walk back from their recommendation. Uh, but overall, uh, Library of Michigan staff were, um, were pretty much all former librarians um, or people have worked in related fields. But we now work for the state. Um, my life is now spreadsheets. I don't do programming anymore. So I rely on the peer reviewers to tell me, yes, this is good modern standard library practice. Uh, and we're going to take their comments very seriously. We are going to use your information to report to the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, again, write succinctly and clearly, be detailed. Um, they are different topics. Avoid jargon and acronyms. Your peer reviewer might be a librarian from a different type of library. It may not be familiar um, with something that would be obvious to a public librarian or obvious to an academic. Uh, so try and make it reviewer friendly. Um, sometimes we do have school librarians as well. In the outcome-based evaluation part, um, you may have to do pre and post testing if that is applicable. Um, and outcome-based evaluation is not um, numbers, it's not outputs, it's not how many things you scan, it is participant knowledge, skills, attitudes, and actions. So if you are using these materials uh, to provide better quality services to your community, the outcome will be, did your community learn more when they used it? <clears throat> you may have some timing issues with that, if you want to talk that through with me, you're welcome to. You do need to keep track of, of outputs, number of items, number of attendees, number of things you scan. And that is listed in that um, grant activity statistics guide. A little bit more information here on outcome evaluation. It says something that IMLS has a formal definition for it. But essentially, they are looking at users or participants' reactions uh, to the content you provide or the service you provide. There's some more information on where you can find outcome-based evaluation. IMLS does have an OBE website. There are required evaluation questions. Those were one of those six additional documents I showed you. If you provide content uh, to library staff or the public, uh, for example, if you're digitizing, you will likely do that. If you do training to, whoops, library staff as part of your proposal, or if you do training to the public as part of your proposal, there are specific questions that IMLS requires that are on that handout. Uh, and I will literally need to type in the answers that they provided to you for those evaluation questions. So you will need to consider that. <clears throat> if your proposal does not uh, fall in line with those and you're not entirely sure how you should evaluate, feel free to contact me and we can talk about it. Sustainability is not just about funding. I see a lot of proposals where sustainability is, and we're going to ask uh, another funder for more funding um, when we're done with the grant activities listed here. That's my least favorite sustainability comment. I do like to see uh, things where you are addressing how to continue 
funding it if you do need uh, money for it, but also how you can continue those outcomes. You know, will your staff continue to promote? Um, will you be doing something? You know, I'm going to draw from other ideas here, but um, if you are providing training for your staff on changing story time, how you're going to continue to do that type of activity after the grant is over. So think of sustainability not only in funding, but also how you can continue to provide those activities and reach out for those outcomes in your community. You know, will you do staff changes? Will you reorganize duties to keep this project going? Uh, if you have partners, will the part partnerships continue? <clears throat> um, if you have partners, your partner statement should include the partner institution, who the contact person and contact information is there, and the partner statement. The partner statement can be an MOU if you have created an MOU and done that. If not, it should be, and the MOU should be signed. Uh, if it is not an MOU, it should be something on the partner's letterhead where the partner says, we acknowledge we are working with the lead organization who's applying for this grant to do these activities. The application checklists, again, they're very easy. Um, of those four areas, you pick what applies to your proposal and they are just check boxes. Don't spend any time on it. Um, and then the project budget is fairly large. You have all of the range of options for a federal budget. You can do salaries. Um, this includes wages and benefits. You can do consultant fees, travel, supplies and materials, equipment, services, or indirect. And I'm going to stop and ask you a question. Um, I'm taking a little more time than I expected. Uh, it is almost 11 o'clock. Uh, do you guys want me to continue or do you need me to close at 11? I think I have about 10, 15 more minutes. I have one vote for continue. Okay, several votes for continue. All right, I'll keep going. Yes, uh, Janet, I, I will, the recording, I will send it out to all of you. Okay, my apologies for, for not meeting my time frame. Your overall budget, there is a question in the application that says, how much are you asking for? Your, your budget spreadsheet should match that. When you're asking for funds, keep in mind for the expenses, you need to ask for things that are allowable, allocable, and necessary. Allowable meaning it's something that you can use federal funds for. We've already said food is a problem for this program. Construction is not allowed. A lockable is something I have never heard outside of federal grant circles. What that means is can you allocate all of the purchase to grant activities? If you can, you can request reimbursement for the entire cost. If you cannot, you can only request reimbursement for the percentage that you used on the grant. An example is, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons we don't like to see office supplies. You bought reams of paper to do printing uh, for part of what you're doing. Technically, you can only ask reimbursement for the amount of paper that you used. So keep this in mind. Um, another example might be if you turn in receipts for purchases and include some grant funded things and some not grant funded things that your receipt would clearly identify what was actually used in the grant and you're only requesting reimbursement for those. Uh, a common example in a library would be you've sent me your Baker and Taylor uh, invoice for the last month but you've noted to me which ones were used in the grant and which ones were not. And it also has to be necessary. So you should list things for purchase um, or, or for inclusion in grant costs that you have to do to do the grant. Um, things that you do not have to do, um, for example, this is where you go awry with furnishings is, you know, we want to do computer training classes um, and we'd really like to upgrade our chairs too. But you currently have chairs, you don't need new chairs to do uh, training uh, on computers. You do need the computers and the software, they are necessary, the chairs would not be. So if that makes sense to you guys. I've got a little more detail here. Uh, just basically pay attention to the allowable cost section. Um, 
if you request something that is not allowable and your application is approved, I am going to reach out to you to have you revise your budget. Uh, if you get that kind of email or phone call from me, please respond quickly. If you do purchase something or uh, spend funds on something that is not allowable, I will not reimburse you. I, I have no legal right to reimburse you. So I essentially will carve that amount out of your reimbursement request and only reimburse you for the allowable amounts. So if you're at all concerned on this, uh, talk to me. Uh, even if you, your budget is approved, talk to me before you spend the funds. Um, we would much rather spend some time ahead uh, versus uh, have issues where you might be responsible for costs that you weren't expecting later. If it's a lockable, you have to use it fully uh, for the grant. And finally, if it's necessary. So things you should include in the budget. You need to in include amounts as well as specific items. Uh, in the budget spreadsheet, there is uh, a narrative column. That's where I'm expecting you to explain the details of what you're going to purchase. I need to buy a scanner, this model. Um, then you have an amount column. Um, if you're going to ask for salary costs, uh, I don't expect to see salaries, $10,000. I expect to see you know, local history librarian, 10 hours a week. Um, maybe there's an explanation in the proposal for how you came up with 10 hours a week. Uh, then you list their approved salary um, rate and then calculate out that amount. So if you don't have an explanation in the narrative column, I'm going to be reaching back out to you and um, it's unlikely you'll be approved uh, if your narrative column is weak in the budget proposal. The budget items must match your proposal activities. Occasionally we will get a budget where, you know, for example, with children's services, they've talked about outreach to parents and the activities they're going to do day to day in the library. And in the budget, all of a sudden, a children's database pops up that they haven't talked about using. And it's like, well, no, we're, we're not going to approve something if you aren't actually using it. However, the reverse is true. The proposal activities must match the budget. They should be, there should be a one-to-one -one connection um, between the proposal activities and the budget. If you're going to use salaries and benefits, be careful about the supplanting versus supplementing. If it's somebody who is already on staff, we would not expect to be paying 40 hours a week of their time. We would be ex expect to be paying, you know, five hours a week, 10 hours a week, where you've carved out some time for them for the activities. Uh, but you're just not using us to replace their salary. Do you keep in mind at the point you have staff working that are grant funded, you are going to have to document the time uh, that they spend. It's going to be per pay period, per staff person throughout the project. I would explain that in the grant administration webinar, uh, but be aware you're going to have to do that documentation and you will be reimbursed at their current salary that you pay them for their other work. You cannot request the grant pay them a different uh, uh, hourly wage than you pay them for their other activities. Consultants versus services. Most of you won't actually have consultant fees. A consultant is someone who gives you advice. And they help you develop a plan. Services are someone who does work for you, someone who does web hosting, someone who does programming, someone who teaches a class, someone who may digitize something for you. Those are all services. A consultant says you should consider this. You know, a consultant might be a lawyer, a consultant might be, you know, a planning consultant on how to develop a project. So if you think you have consultant services and you want to double check, again, I've said this a lot, uh, reach out to me and we can talk about it. If you're doing travel, you're going to use the federal rates and rules. That actually should make everybody happy because they're usually more generous than state and local rules. Um, you can do a per diem um, for a city for food if you need to send staff for training as part of the proposal. There's a federal mileage rate for cars. Um, you cannot ask for reimbursement for, uh, for example, a staff member coming into work the day they're working on grant activities. However, if you're sending them out to a partner uh, to do grant meetings or something, you could ask for reimbursement for mileage for something like that. 
and equipment versus supplies. This is one other one of those quirky federal things. Equipment is something that costs more than $5,000 for an individual item, a single laptop, a single server. Um, it is not a group of laptops that you're going to use for computer training. So for the most part, you're not likely to have equipment. Um, if you do have equipment, um, do make sure that I have confirmed with you, if your grant is approved, that you have been approved by IMLS. We request in writing and document that the IMLS has approved equipment. Um, you should never purchase equipment before you see that approval documentation from me. Supplies are everything else that you buy. Computer software, computers, um, I'm sitting here thinking things that you would need for, you know, our summer grant program. There's, there's an awful lot of craft supplies that fall in that one. Um, it doesn't matter if it's technical equipment. What matters is the cost. So indirect costs. Uh, a lot of people don't ask for them, at least in public library land. Uh, if you have not reached the cap of 25000 when you get done uh, figuring out your budget costs, I encourage you to ask for indirect as well. Most universities do ask for it. These are the things that you can't allocate that are not allocable. Um, you can't figure out how much of your electricity bill went to grant activities. You can't figure out how much your rent went to grant activities. However, the federal government is aware that these are costs that you need to pay to be able to do both your day-to-day -day activities, but also your grant. So you can ask for indirect costs. These are things you do not need to document. You either um, add a percentage of indirect on each reimbursement request um, off of what your costs were on that reimbursement, or at the very end of the grant, you assess the rate on what your final costs were. So if you do not already have a federal indirect cost rate agreement, if you're a public library, the answer is probably no. You can ask for what they call a de minimis rate of 10%. The de minimis rate is ev applies to everything except equipment, um, and it doesn't apply to anything over 25000 Since this grant caps at 25000 it doesn't matter. So the maximum you can ask for is uh, $2,500 with the de minimis rate. Um, if you're like, well, how about I negotiate a federal rate? Because I would like more than 10%. The Library of Michigan cannot negotiate rates. We are not a federal agency. And IMLS will not negotiate rates. They're small and have a very small staff. There are three program officers for the entire LSTA program. Um, I'm extremely sympathetic to them as someone who reports to them. I sent them 187 pages for Michigan's annual report last year alone. I felt so bad for a program officer. <laughs> Um, indirect cost rates are part of the total budget. They are not in addition. So if you have already hit $25,000 in costs without indirect, then you don't have any more room in your budget. Uh, there is a document on the indirect costs. That was one of those six documents I showed you. Um, I, I don't have a slide on that. Okay, for academic libraries, if you have a current negotiated rate with a federal agency, this is something that your development department or your university administration would be who you would talk to. You would need to provide a copy of that agreement in the grant and we will accept that rate. Um, that said, the higher the rate is, the less funds you will have actually to do the grant activities. Um, so if there are multiple indirect cost rates in your university, you may want to negotiate with uh, your university administration uh, for a lower one so that you can spend more money on the actual grant activities. The budget narrative, just as a recap, I'm expecting um, the actual amount where you list money to be salaries, 10,000, but the narrative should be this staff member, this many hours and this rate. If your materials are a total of 5,000, then I want an explanation of we're going to buy 10 laptops for our youth coding activities that we described in the project description, and they're this much each. And then you get down to the final details. Your SIPA compliance statement, your certification is at time of application, and you have two options. You have complied, 
or it does not apply because you are either not asking for things that can access the internet or you are not an applicable library, which is what academics would select. It does apply to the applicant institution and all partners who are schools or public libraries. So you can't say, I'm going to take computers and I'll filter them in my library, but when the partner uses them, the partner doesn't want to filter, so they don't filter. Um, if you're using grant funded computers at a partner institution, the filtering would apply there as well. The board certifications, they certify that the applicant has the legal authority to apply for funding, uh, that you're going to comply with federal regulations, that you're not going to use LSTA funds to supplant local funding, and that all the information in the application is truthful as far as uh, you know. There are certifications within that about debarment, lobbying, and other federal regulations. Um, that it's where we get into the issue of your authorized official needs to be someone who legally can say you will comply with all of that. So that last bit on certifications, the signatures need to be original, they need to be dated, and all four lines need to be filled out. If you submit by the Friday before, I'll double check that. Um, if you submit the day of, um, if I catch it before the deadline, I'll let you know. But I might not. It depends on how many applications we get. So what's our process after you submit the application? Um, we do scoring. Uh, the rubric is in the application packet. So you can see exactly how the peer reviewers are going to go through the proposal. It's also scored by the LM staff. The state librarian makes the final decision. And the award comes from the state superintendent of education. If you are approved, you will get an award letter and a grant award notice signed by Dr. Rice. Uh, just as an FYI with the application scoring rubric, if you score within 0 to 60 percent of the possible points, which are 100, we are not going to discuss your grant in the peer review meetings. If it's 60 to 80 percent, uh, if we still have money on the table after we go through the first cut, we may discuss the grant and uh, consider it for approval. Likelihood is if you're in that range, I'm going to ask you for revisions. If you score in the 80 to 100 percent, you, your proposal will be discussed. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will be approved. It depends on how much funding um, is represented by proposals in that 80 to 100 percent range. But there will be a discussion in the peer review meeting for anything that falls in that last section. I've recapped the scoring rubric in here for you really quick. There's a proposal relationship to grant priorities, which we talked about in the beginning, and then very specific relationship to program guidelines. How good is your abstract? How good is your purpose? How good is your project need? Your project impact, your project design. And we've picked out points for each of these. Um, you see, as you go further down in the uh, proposal, their higher points uh, and your budget spreadsheet is 10 points as well so keep that in mind we'll do our reviewing in july we'll announce in august and you should have letters we hope in august and finally our disclaimer it is a competitive grant submitting a proposal does not mean you'll be funded and if you are funded you are going to have to do a grant admin meeting with me and you have a three-year records retention. Do be aware about the start date that I already said. Uh, don't expend funds that you need to be reimbursed before that start date. If you get a conditional award letter, and it will say that in bold at the top, you'll need to work with me to do revisions before you can start your grant. So um, if you get your award letter and it says conditional award at the top, uh, double check and make sure you've gotten an email from me, you know, hopefully it didn't get caught in somebody's spam filter. Uh, do reach out to me if your letter says that. And if you receive funding, be aware you have to follow federal standards with federal money, conflicts of interest, audit requirements, etc. I will discuss that in detail in the grant administration meeting. So I am going to end my slideshow and show you a couple other quick things. 
and then let you get back to your day. This is the website that I kept referencing, michigan.gov slash LSTA. It looks a little funky right now with our logo off to the side. Um, um, it'll take us a, a couple of weeks to make sure all of our content ported to the new website correctly. As you go down the page, there's information about our various programs. Here's information about the UEI numbers um, that I mentioned if you don't have one. And there is an overview about how to make sure you get how to get one. And then here are our grants information. This is the Improving Access program. If you click on this link, you're going to come here. This recaps the priorities and the guidelines and the eligibility. I did put Tuesday here. This is where you can register for business uh, planning for a digitization or preservation project. That will be required that you either watch it live with Biz or watch the recording. So if that date is not a good date, register anyway, and then um, you can watch the recording. You'll be sent a recording like you will with today's. And then here are the forms and documents. For this particular local history and special collections, the application packet is the second one. We have split these this year. So there's slightly different information. Project timeline, here's the grant admin manual for both, uh, or excuse me, all three priorities. Here is that SIPA form and certifications and assurances. It is one form. Make sure you fill out page one, page two, and the final page. This is the budget worksheet that you need to fill out and submit. If you are going to digitize materials, this is the rights assessment template that we would like you to include. And then it, when it says active grant form, these are things you would use if your grant is approved to submit reimbursements, et cetera. So when you come down here, this is the application link. This is the link to the digital, excuse me, the digital inclusion and literacy. This is the link to the local history. Um, and then once you have started an application, uh, I highly recommend saving frequently uh, and maybe saving your proposal text in a document as well. Um, when you come back to it, do not click on open an application again. That will start a new application. Sometimes I get emails where people are like, everything is gone. And usually what's happened is they've clicked on open an application. When you want to return to your application, or if you have an approved application, you need to submit a reimbursement and report, you click on this link here, and that goes to the grant account you will set up. Uh, and finally, here are those six documents and Sometimes these are links to other sites. So here's the crediting IMLS or LM that goes to an LM media kit page. Here's the outcome based evaluation. This takes you to IMLS's website. This is a document on indirect costs. Here's our statistics guide for grant activities. Here's a reimbursement record, request checklist <clears throat> and the evaluation questions document. So I'm gonna show you what it looks like when you click on open an application. And I already have a login. So I've, if you're a new applicant, you would click on new applicant. And this displays a little funky in uh, Firefox. I'm using Firefox. You can see each section I talked to you uh, is across the top. Applicant information, project information, project proposal, partners, your goals, intents, and subjects. Those are those checklists. Here's where you attach your budget, your certifications, and your other appendices. This is where you certify that, yes, I, I know I have, I'm applying for a grant and everything is truthful. And that final tab is you review the application, make corrections if you have uh, not filled out something that is required, uh, and then you would submit in that last screen. Save and finish later is this at the top. Next takes you to the next screen. You can also just click on the tab at the top. Um, some things to uh, keep in mind, if you log back in later, whoops, it doesn't like me because I didn't fill out something. Um, 
you should see everything that you've done. If I'm going to go back to applicant information, if you already have an account and you use that account, which I highly recommend, um, you should not start a new account and have a single grant under a separate account. It will, oops, it's not doing, ah, I know why it doesn't. It's trying to make me do the LSTA request. So we'll type in 5,000. I'm going to go back to applicant information. Since I already have an account, you can see it is pre-filled. It knows who I am from the account. So if you've already done a grant with us, keep using that old account and that saves you a little bit of time on that directory information. When you go to the page where you do attachments, I do have some background information. I explain how to do the uploading. Um, I'm going to tell you, wait for a few seconds. You're going to browse to a file. Um, you're going to click on the file. Don't click right off the page until the file name appears right here and is a clickable link. That's when it is actually uploaded all the way to the server. Um, if you click off this page before the upload is finished, it will not go through completely. So browse, select your file, click upload, and then wait for that file to show up. Um, and I'm not going to do it there because that's an Excel file, but I can just pick something off my desktop to show you. I'll pick my IMLS training agenda upload. And then I'm going to wait for a second. Now I can see that clickable link. Um, then I'm done. It's there. If you want to make sure you uploaded the correct thing, you can now open it and it will show you your document. And it just uploaded the other screen. It was an agenda for an IMLS training. You guys don't care about that. So this is what you need to submit by uh, five on May 31st. This is the page where you need to attach budget certifications, appendices, if you're going to do citations and references, your indirect cost agreement, if you have one, resumes, statistical and background information. This is where you would include <clears throat> I was going to say this is where you include your rights assessment. And this is not displaying correctly. I need to double check that. Note for Karen. Um, once you have an application started, when you go to that third link where it says return to an application, let me exit out of this one. This is what it will look like when you log in. This is your grant account. These are applications that I've started and not submitted. Uh, if you want to confirm you have submitted an application, check this drop down menu. When you go to submitted, you now see it here. You can email it to yourself. If you email it to yourself, the links of any attachments are live. You can reopen those documents. If you're in progress, you can share it with other people. You've got a partner you're working with and you want to mail them a copy. So that's something to keep in mind. And finally, once your grant is accepted, your reimbursement and reports will be on this page. Right now, in my account, I don't have any new requirements. Um, and I have no in progress. I submitted all my test ones. And then if I look under submitted, I can see things that I have done in the past. Here's my ARPA final report that I was using for testing. Uh, if you're submitting things, it did not actually go through until you see it under this drop down menu. So that is that account. So I'm going to stop screen sharing. Um, does anyone have any questions? I did a lot of give me a call if you have questions. So as you're thinking through your project, um, that's a very serious offer. I would much, much, much rather we spend some time talking or emailing than you spend time working on an application uh, only to find out that there was an issue with it that we could have helped beforehand. Uh, we want this to be as good an experience as possible. Uh, and we want to be able to fund your request. So if you have any questions at all, please do reach out.
gotcha. Um, all righty, then this is the end of it. I apologize for how long I took. Um, I'll have to let the next uh, application webinar folks know that I may drift over a little. And you have until May 31st, um, watch business, uh, attend or watch business um, presentation on April 7th. And, and we hope to see an application from you. Have a good afternoon.